Okay, I, uh, before I get really started on the program, just got a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, one is that uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm moving. Already purchased a new house and our house in Santa Fe is for sale. Uh, but we're moving to Rio Rancho, so <laughs> so hopefully I'll be able to come more often. Yeah. And um, yeah, my my wife and, and myself, but particularly my wife, is having trouble with two stories uh, up and down the stairs. So we're going to one story, but houses are just too dead come expensive in Santa Fe. So yeah. um, we're going to be uh, hopefully this summer sometime. So if you're looking for a four bedroom house in Santa Fe, look me up. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as some of you know, I, I have a business, uh, Pastel Porter. I sell these uh, plein air um, pastel handling system. And um, the supplier I had uh, is, is retired and uh, not making boxes anymore. I haven't found a box maker yet, so I'm out of inventory and uh, more or less just waiting uh, on uh, finding a new supplier. But I've also got the business up for sale, so if anybody wants to... Uh, get into the um, uh, market for art supplies and uh, pastel boxes, look me up or send me a reference. I'm more than happy to, to talk to anybody. I want to spend more time painting. So let me uh, get this started. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, some of the experience uh, that I had as a, as a commercial artist for about 25 uh, or almost 30 years, uh, I apply some of the tools and uh, techniques that I learned there to hopefully improve my uh, uh, fine art work. But particularly, I have a few things that I do that when I'm teaching uh, uh, workshops, uh, particularly for people that are um, uh, haven't had uh, very much experience and uh, need some, some tools to help them in terms of improving their painting by improving their preparation. Um, I have found that uh, the most important skill uh, in painting is the ability to draw well. And no matter how well you can paint, that if the drawing is poorly done or inaccurate, uh, then the painting can't, can't rescue it. Uh, but if the drawing is very well, done very well, you can do a, a great job of, a paint, of painting or even a mediocre job of painting and it'll be a successful work or more likely to be successful. So I have a few tools that I use that comes over from the, uh, from the commercial art world using computers as well as other tools that I'm going to try to touch on today that improve the, the uh, drawing. Uh, as a beginning painter, uh, often people have very little drawing skills, which I really encourage uh, uh, them. To, uh, the most important thing they can do is take a drawing class, take life drawing, uh, portrait drawing, uh, get involved in some local uh, community college, whatever, and draw, draw, draw. But in the meantime, uh, there's no sense, there's no need for their, their painting to suffer from their lack of drawing skills. So I use a few tools to help improve the drawing so that they will uh, be more confident in their painting. Uh, because what happens if you have a poor drawing, during the painting, you try to fix the drawing and you tighten up and you can't be spontaneous because you're constantly fixing a poor drawing. But if you have a good drawing, then you're free and your creative flow is not interrupted by trying to fix a poor uh, uh, placement or sizing or proportions in the drawing. So I'm going to show you a few things that I do. Uh, uh, particularly in my workshops, but also occasionally in, uh, for myself, uh, in preparing a picture for, uh, for painting. And uh, in this case, I'm using uh, Photoshop Elements, which is a photo manipulation program, and there are many others besides this that, that do basically the same things. Photoshop Elements is, uh, is a, a cheaper version of Photoshop, but it's all that you need. Uh, Photoshop is like six or seven hundred dollars and it'll do everything that you'll ever need to do uh, for in most cases. So here's a scene uh, and uh, the uh, the first thing uh, that uh, I want to talk about here on this is that uh, 
uh, I normally look for something that it attracts me quickly, whether it's from a photograph or life. This, the Spence, was the most appealing part of this scene, but uh, it needed some help. And so uh, it, it was necessary to change to a, uh, uh, improve the uh, uh, placement of elements. Uh, but I'm not going to be really touching much into that. What I want to do primarily is talk about the editing. Let me see. There we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about the editing of the scene uh, to improve the quality for, for the painter. And so, for example, here, let me go to this. Um, I've got the cropping more or less what I like uh, in this scene. And there are some things that you can do in a computer program that can quickly give you some help in terms of correcting the image. Uh, let me uh, get those things out of the way. In a program like this, there are enhancements that you can that you can make. Um, excuse me, enhancements that you can make. Uh, that, for example, in um, in the lighting. You can change the, the way that uh, the, sh the shadows are affected by it. just simply uh, uh, making minor adjustments. You can make major changes in the painting. And this can be helpful in establishing your contrast control. And by the way, I'm not trying to teach you how to do this. I'm trying to show you what you can do with a few in uh, simple instruments. So don't try to remember all this. I just want to show you what you can do. And where it really comes in helpful, for example, in a shadowed area, like this, uh, this right here. If I uh, take that and select it and go up here, run down to my lighting, I can lighten up that uh, shadow area and see what's happening in there. In actuality, in most photographs, darken the shadows more than they are to your eye. So this can help give you a view of what you probably were actually seeing when you were standing there, but you lost in the photograph. So you can see some details that are happening in there. That's just one example. And uh, also you can, of course, adjust um, uh, contrast. It has auto contrast controls. Uh, you can take and make a selection of an area like this fence and the shadows in front there. I'm going to hide those marching ants there. And again, go in and change the, the detail. How much of that fence do you really want? How dark do you want it? And uh, frankly, when I worked on this, I liked it fairly dark. But you can see the detail that's going on in there. Uh, there, there are um, a variety of other controls in terms of sharpening and and uh, uh, brightness and contrast, where you can really, uh, well, let's see, I gotta deselect this first. Okay, and go to levels here. You can, you can lighten it up. You can increase your contrast by at the same time darkening it. Get it in extreme looks here to get a sense of the design. For example, this shows you where all the major elements, the very major darks are to give you a sense of design. Get rid of that. You can also um, change it from, uh, you know, uh, uh, black to, uh, to black and white to see uh, how it looks in black and white and then control again the contrast to get a good sense of of the design in there of your darks and lights it almost is a built-in no 10 uh, that you can use to study an image now this is a basically a simple image uh, I didn't want to get a complex one but it, the more complex the image is the more helpful a tool like this can be and uh, let me let's see go to one more up another one. Here it is. Uh, there is a uh, a problem with 
judging colors and values that hopefully all of you have experienced at one time or another. And um, part of what it involves is uh, seeing colors and values in contrast to one another. And the, the values are very much affected, as well as colors are affected by what's around them. So sometimes it's helpful to separate out a color to see what the uh, color is standing alone. So for example here, you can take uh, what's called a uh, uh, eye drop tool and you can click anywhere in a picture and down here down here right here this little box it will show you what that color is so you can switch to blue to white you can see the green in here um, in fact you can even choose how much of that area you want like a five pixel square of it which will give you a better average so this is the actual blue of that sky against the gray. Uh, this is the green of, of this tree. This is the dark green of the tree. This is the, the foreground, I mean, the, yeah, the middle ground right in here. The overall uh, color value of that. This is very helpful in judging your colors where you can separate them out. But how I've uh, started using it to help um, especially uh, students working from a photograph that haven't been experienced with it, is to create a, uh, a limited palette of pastels. And that's hard to do with pastels, if you've ever tried it. <laughs> uh, and so what I found was a, a, a technique to get around the, uh, the difficulties of pulling out uh, specific colors for a limited palette by using this tool here. And let me show you. First of all, I'm going to take this image and uh, I'm going to change and resize it so that the image is, uh, is 10 inches across. And again, this is something don't worry about trying to remember how all this works. This is something that uh, uh, that I teach in my workshop when I can. Okay, it's so 10 inches across, but it's actually, it's, if you look there, it's about six and a half inches high because it's it's essentially a four by six. So I make a little change, change it to eight inches, so that's an eight by ten. So you see the image there. The, there's an extra inch or two at the bottom uh, that gives me something to work with, and I'm, let me show you how I do that. And I do it this way, by the way, I'll show you. I do it this way because what I want to do is create a palette, like an oil painting palette, except for pastels, right along the bottom here. I make an eight by 10 print, I send it to Walgreens, have a print made, and then I use that to teach how to choose your colors and values and how to limit your palette and start out by laying out all your your most uh, useful colors for that particular picture and I'll show you how to do that and if you'd like um, let me just pass this around so you can get this, see what I mean but how I do that is is for example I've got the blue sky I'm going to select it here and I'm going to create another layer and this basically is, uh, again, something that uh, you don't need to know all the, the exact steps involved, but it, it can be easily learned. I have a little video on that. Uh, okay, so here we go. We've got down here at the bottom, I, I look at that and I think, well, you know, it would be a lot easier to um, judge my color against the gray. So I, I select this area down here at the bottom I go up to uh, my windows and select color swatches. And over here, if you hold that eyedropper tool over these different colors of gray, it tells you what colors are. And there's one that's here that's, here that's exactly 50% gray, which is the best way to judge a value in a color is against a 50% gray background. I click on that, and I've got this area down here selected. And I fill that selection with 50% gray. And now I'm going to take and draw a little box. 
right there. And I'm going to click in my blue, for example, my sky, and go up here and uh, feel that blue sky. And then I can take, let's see, get my selector. selected all of those I've created those little boxes I've got the, the blue sky so now I can take select this green I want to see what this average green is here and I'll pop it into that one and if you'll notice there look at if, uh, if, if you know how to, you know how to judge a, uh, a value by how it compares to 50% gray uh, this is almost exactly a 50% value of green. That's helpful to know. Okay, now let's see. I'll take another. Uh, I'm going to look at the foreground here. I'm just going to click on that and fill. Selection. And now I've got the foreground. Look at that. It's also almost exactly a 50% value. Um, these are... Uh, uh, very helpful in figuring out your your not only your basic color but your basic values because a lot of folks have serious trouble this discerning values and this is a big help in doing that especially in comparison to grays so I got the side of the building there I'm gonna fill it it's almost also a 50% gray and if you'll notice most paintings, the dominant value is going to be a middle tone. That's the, the, just the basic truth of, of most images. Now I'm going to go in there, most paintings, and I'm going to look a little closer, and I'm going to uh, select this little area right there, which is a very important uh, uh, part of the scene. And select that and um, fill the selection. The more expensive uh, Photoshop, there's a lot of tools that they work a little faster than this, but this works fine for, uh, for this application. So you see how, how light this, uh, this is. In your, this is basically your lightest light, one of your lightest lights in the whole picture. And you can start seeing your comparison of colors here. Now, I usually do about uh, eight or ten selections across the picture, all the major areas of values and color, pick those little uh, color swatches, and then I take out my pastel, uh, you know, uh, uh, box, in my case, and I pull out the colors that match these, and I can even test them against a gray or middle tone background to, to try to get the exact value so that... I have it, uh, determined in advance the right color and the right value for each given area of the painting. Now with each one of those uh, choices, each one of those uh, little color patches or uh, limited palette, uh, uh, limited pastel uh, list that you have there, then you'll have a lighter and a darker version of it to work with within the, this area. For example, this area uh, here uh, in this middle ground, there's actually some greens and, and browns and so forth in there, but you know that your greens and browns, by and large, are going to need to be in the 50% range. And you, and you can get very subtle effects. Now, obviously, here it's not hard to figure. This is, a pretty, this is pretty dark. But you can also go in there and uh, by looking um, more closely at a scene like this, uh, really see the variations of grays that are in there a lot easier than doing it with just your eyes. And the older I get, the more I appreciate that. <laughs> and what I found is this is really helpful, particularly for beginning painters who haven't got the, a clue as to how to select their pastels. 
and how to choose uh, a dark or light or middle tone. So they can look in here and see that, that light blue sky, how it compares with these other values and the light, the, the light of that roof. Those are very similar in value. They're, they're, they're the light range. And, and, and uh, when I'm teaching, uh, the basic principle is that a light is anything that is lighter than a 50% value. I normally paint on a 50% value uh, paper or canvas. So anything that's lighter than that is a light. Anything that's darker than that is a dark. It helps uh, organize your thinking. It helps you in selecting uh, your, your uh, pastel sticks and so forth. So once I have done this and I've created a, uh, uh, a series of uh, color patches here, uh, then I just take this, this right here and uh, save it. Uh, as an image and uh, send it off to Walgreens and have them, you know, print out an 8 by 10 and then also uh, or 5 by 6s by or 4 by 6s, whatever size you like to work with. Um, but again, the larger size does make it a little bit easier to see things. So this is just one way to use a computer and for those of you that don't feel confident with a computer, the tools I'm using here are very simple. They're very minimal basic tools that you can use and they work with a with a you know laptop as well as the, your, your pads and so forth and I'm sure most of you have uh, played around with uh, with uh, figuring out your um, uh, use of your computer in, in imaging but this is just an example of one way you can use it now probably one of the most useful ways to use it however is in taking an image and figure out how you want to place it onto a particular canvas. Like this image is essentially four by six. Uh, and let's say I want to paint it on an 11 by 14. That's my canvas. Well, a four by six is a lot more rectangular than 11 by 14. So there are some things you can do simply with this to help you crop your image. So I take my cropping tool up here which is in this marquee tool and I go down at the bottom here and if you look at the bottom it says fixed ratio let's see here well not very visible anyway it's fixed ratio there's different ratios you can pick normal fixed ratio and fixed size I, fix, I picked a fixed ratio I typed in 11 by 14. That's the size I want to paint. And so any, any box I draw in this picture is exactly 11 by 14 inches, uh, 11 by 14 in proportion. So I can take and um, um, let's say take an area that I think I want to crop and pull this over and that is my 11 by 14. Let's say that's the cropping I like. I may move it over here a lot, a little bit. And I can go up here then and um, crop. crop it. Now that is an 11 by 14 image, exactly. And you may, you may wonder, well, what's, what's so important about that? Well, if you look at the, uh, let's see, maybe get a little bit closer. If you look at the image here, you'll notice that there are rulers around the edge here. Now this is where it's, it's very useful. For example, in this 11 by 14, this image says that it's, it's actually uh, 7 and almost 8 by about 6. Well, I can go up here and by changing uh, the sizing on that to, I just need to change the width here in this case, 14 inches. It shows to be, this is 11 by 14. That means that the measurements in this ruler will now be, the ruler we see up here will now be starting with zero to 14 and zero down to 11. So, any place in that picture 
uh, I want to find, I can find it, I can go over here and let's see the point of this fence post. Do you see where that is? I can look up at the ruler and that shows it's a little, it's just right at 11 and a half inches wide. And I can look at the other ruler and let's see where it is. Okay, it's about six inches down. So I can go to my 11 by 14 image and, and measure over 11 and a half inches and make a little mark. And then measure down the six or so inches, make a little, little X on it. And then I know on my 11 by 14, that's exactly the placement uh, of that fence post in that drawing, in, in that image. Now, if that's all you did, it would be a tremendous help in terms of drawing the rest of the image. This is just a tool to help you. If you, you know, if you do it by eye, you can estimate, well, let's see, that fence post is about here. Well, you know how easily your eyes are deceived. This way you can at least start out with one point that you know is exactly right. And from there on, <coughs> draw the rest of the picture. Or, even better, find several points. The more points you find, the more accurate your drawing is going to be. And so even as a beginner who is very, uh, uh, you know, inexperienced in drawing, can get a reasonably drawn image before he starts painting, simply by plotting out a few simple points. And then as you increase in your drawing skills, you, you uh, plot fewer and fewer points. But this is just a, an aid to help you do a drawing. And uh, I put a lot of emphasis on drawing. And so I, I try to find tools that are helpful in doing that. And there is another tool that I want to show you here. Um, for those of you that just hate computers and won't have anything to do with them, I've actually got an analog 2000, you know, 20th century approach to this <laughs> um, as well. And I'll show you how that works. Excuse me. Yes, question. Oh, could you suggest uh, where you might go to find a tutorial or a book or something that teaches you how to use elements? What, what would be the best source? The best it would be to go on YouTube and just do a search for uh, tutorials on, uh, on the, uh, the basics of uh, Adobe Elements, for example. Okay. And actually, some of, this, some of the things I'm doing now, I, I'm making videos uh, for this, this very purpose. But there, there are plenty of them online that you can go find. That would be very helpful. Okay, let me see here. Now, what did I do with it? And y'all got those pictures, by the way. I want those back. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is called a proportion wheel. And if you've ever taken a workshop from me, you probably have seen this. Uh, this is another tool. It looks, it looks very complicated, but it's actually very simple to use. And so I'm going to show you real quickly how it's used in doing basically the same thing I just showed you on the computer. And let me see if I can make this work. Slideshow. Here we go. Okay. I'm just going to show you how to use this tool to take a picture and put it on a 11 by 14. Again, it's going to be a 4 by 6. And what we're trying to do is take this 4 by 6 picture and put it on 11 by 14. I'm just going to run through this quickly. Uh, when you have a 4 by 6 and uh, you want to uh, convert it, you take the dimension that's most important. In this case, it's the uh, 11, it's the uh, 4 inch dimension. I don't want to crop any of the depth. I don't mind cropping some width. So I use the picture to set my, my, my vertical. And uh, let's see here, to set my vertical. This is not moving like it's supposed to. There we go. That's the four inches. And then I take that and I compare the 
4 inches to the 11 inches height. And I take my proportion wheel and I line up 4 on the little wheel with 11 on the big wheel. And that's all you have to do. That's the only calculation you make. Anytime you measure the little picture, you use the little wheel. When you measure the big picture, you use the big wheel. So uh, once I have done this, the proportional relationship between the little picture and the big canvas you're working on is established. How is it established, Mike? I don't the 4 to the 11. The short dimension of the little picture yeah. is lined up with the uh, short dimension on the big picture. 4 to 11 is a proportional relationship. Got that. And once that's done, all you do is tape it down, and that's the only calculation you make, is that one little calculation, connecting the 4 to 11. Now this could be any size picture converted to any size canvas. You just line up, in this case, the horizontals, the 4 to 11 in this case. The 11 inch and the 4 inch now are lined up. Now, uh, I've got the uh, 14 inch width. Uh, it tells me how much I'm going to have to crop off from my 4 by 6. So I go to my wheel again, it's taped down, nothing's changed. The canvas width is 14, so I look at 14. What's below 14 on the little wheel is exactly 5 and a 16th inch. That means that the picture has to be cropped at 5 and a 16th if I measure from this side. But I could, any, any five, uh, 5 and 1 16th measurement across would give me the proper proportion. So in this case, the picture is cropped on this side. That is exactly 11 by 14 right there. So you've established, by just doing those two things, you've, you've established a perfect relationship between those two pictures. And I'm going to see if this works, showing you how it's used in real life. This is just about three minutes if it works. We've got this picture in a proportional relationship to uh, the canvas that we're going to work with. The crop is here, you know, along these lines. This line, that's basically, sometimes you can take a, uh, a masking tape and tape that off if it's distracting. But uh, here is the image and it's going to be, it's going to be transferred here. This is the, uh, the beauty of setting this up in proportional relationship to your picture is now any measurement I make on this picture, I can transfer directly and perfectly to this picture. So for example, I can measure from this edge to this point where the fence line, where this little post comes up. I measure on the width and it is exactly three and three fourths inches. Okay, so uh, I look here, and this is the uh, this is the small picture I just measured, right? Three and three fourths. So I look at this, look at the small wheel, find three and three fourths, and that three and three fourths is lined up with uh, with what? Three Ten and three eighths. Three and three fourths lines up with ten and three eighths on here. So I measure over ten and three eighths. Right there. Okay. And then I measure from the bottom. And from the bottom it is an inch and five eighths. Exactly. So I go here on my little wheel, because that was the little picture, an inch and five-eighths lines up with four and seven-sixteenths. Four and seven-sixteenths. Right there. Uh, this, this 
line that up there, that intersection there is exactly this intersection here. Now, if that is all I did, if that's all I did, and I started freehand drawing, because I at least know that one point, everything else is going to be more likely to be accurate. I look here, for example, there's that point, and so this little uh, horizon line right here, well, it's just a little above that, you know, the, the, the fifth. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, the purpose of this is to show you that there are tools that you can use to increase and improve your drawing. Now this works wonderfully, especially the bigger your painting is. Uh, you, you do a small painting, at 9 by 12, and it's, you know, you, 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 there's small measurements, it's not that big a deal. You do a 30 by 40, you're, you're off just a little bit in your drawing, the whole thing can be uh, out of whack. This is extremely helpful in doing that, is, is figuring these measurements in the early stages so that you don't have to fix your poor drawing or your inaccurate drawing with your painting later. So uh, let me uh, go on and finish up with one other. Where do you find those wheels? Where can you buy them? Oh, uh, any uh, art supply store or architecture supply, and you can order them online, of course. Check Amazon too. Amazon, Amazon, you know, you can find them inexpensively. And they have uh, smaller, more portable ones. Uh, yeah, pocket. They yeah, they're smaller ones, but, you know, you better be wearing your bifocals. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I only use the biggest one. Okay. Okay, let me... Uh, get uh, a tutorial for Photoshop elements. It's like Photoshop elements for dummies. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I'm sure there's one like Amazon. that. That would be very good. Okay, let me uh, go here. Uh, show you uh, just something here that I think that might be useful. Uh, this, uh, I use this basically in creating a mural. Uh, this is a mural I did for a, a nursery in a, in a church. And uh, uh, it was basically just a 20 foot wall. Uh, creating a mural to use, uh, you know, just to give some uh, some uh, uh, liveliness to the to the room, and just want to give you an idea. First, selecting some images and creating outlines of them, and then taking a wall proportionately. This is the wall, which was 20 feet by 9 feet, and then building in Photoshop, uh, in, um, Photoshop elements uh, the rainbow and then creating these uh, using the, the original drawings that, uh, that I pulled from my clip art and um, uh, created the image that I wanted to paint. And then taking that uh, and transferring it to just line work and uh, printing it out at Kinko's. This is three feet by uh, 20 feet, in this case yeah, by 20 feet. This is a, this is half of it. Taking that and uh, converting it here so that it is uh, 225 inches by 36 inches. So you can create those big images, and have them printed out. This is very inexpensive to print out. 25, 225 inches by 36 inches, and then cr it creates this. Uh, uh, this template for you and then using what are called pounce wheels I run over the entire drawing punches little holes this is basically what I learned as a sign painter back in college uh, this is the same technique that Leonardo da Vinci used in creating his his drawings you take paper do his drawing and it, they'd use a pen they didn't have a wheel use a pen and they'd just go and poke all these holes and um, then um, take a pounce sock, which is literally a sock full of a powder, which is normally uh, uh, some kind of black powder. I actually use the stuff they use for these snap lines, uh, but chalk. it can just you can what chalk chalk, and uh, you just put it in the sock and just pounce it, 
And I, it's exactly, actually, Leonardo probably didn't do that. He probably had assistants doing that. <laughs> uh, because that's, that's all I could do at the sign painters. This was my job, pouncing and, and, and making the little holes. But uh, anyway, and then using, uh, using that, um, you can see, hopefully you can see the pounce. Yeah. Uh -huh. so. Just leaves a light line on there. Then I come in and draw. Oh, that was it. Okay. But anyway, it, just using that to lay out the pattern. So you can do that. But you can do the same thing. And I'm going to show you very quickly here so we can finish up. Uh, I had a commission to do a portrait for um, a, a, a movie called uh, A Woman uh, Walks Ahead. And uh, it was commissioned to do a, a portrait of Sitting Bull because this is about a woman who did a portrait of Sitting Bull and uh, back in the 1890s, somewhere in there. And they made this movie about it and they needed a portrait of Sitting Bull to, for her. And they needed three of them. They needed a beginning, a middle, and an end portrait so they could show her different stages of the portrait. So I did that for them, but I had to use some of these techniques. And I'll show you basically how. This, by the way, is the actual portrait that the woman did. And I asked them, do you want it to look like the actual portrait from, you know, and they said, no, we want it to look like the actor, obviously. <laughs> and uh, the actor didn't look anything like this. <laughs> and so uh, they gave me some pictures to work from. They said, okay, here's some pictures. And we want him looking real proud. We want him wearing a, a, a head, headdress. So this is the picture they gave me. No headdress. So, and then they gave me another one. They said, oh, no headdress. And I finally talked him into getting a picture of him actually with a headdress. Uh, but it wasn't quite posed the way they liked. They liked this angle. And, but the headdress was all floppy. And so I just took the other headdress and put it on him. <laughs> and, uh, and they approved. They approved this image, okay? And um, then I took, and on a large sheet of paper, I, I, I drew a pattern for the painting, and then I took this painting using the pounce method that I was just telling you about on these uh, uh, 24 by 36 canvases, because we had to have three separate canvases, but they all had to be exactly the same except different stage of the drawing or painting. And uh, rather than uh, having to redraw every time I did one pattern, then pounced it on each one of these three canvases. And um, then, uh, yeah, uh, and then there I am working. This is, uh, this is basically I work with a computer screen and my computer and um, uh, using some of those things that we talked about earlier as far as uh, using, making use of the computer. And then this is the first canvas uh, with the initial drawing. Um, and then, then we had several intermediate, and I'd take pictures of them as I'd go, and I said, you want to use this for the middle drawing? No, 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 do a little more. No, do a little more. And we went, oh, do some more. And then when I, when I got to the one they liked, then I sent them that canvas. And this all happened in four days. And the reason it had to be done in four days is that they waited to the last minute to ask me to do this. And that's why I had to do this quick pounce method to transfer to do three paintings in four days. So this is about halfway through that they selected. And then, I think this is the finished image that was what I considered the approved image matching what we had agreed upon. Oh, they didn't like it. They said, <laughs> they said this is a very downer. He gets murdered at the end of the you know, This is a very sad picture. So they said, uh, make the background uh, more stormy. So I created a repainted the background, sent that to him, said, no, it's not, it's still, it's still too updated. We want it to be a little bit more a downer because, again, it's a sad movie. So I actually did another version where, it, you know, there was lightning and it was all dark and there was hardly any, you know, and uh, I didn't get a picture of that one, but I sent him that and said, no, it's still, this didn't get in there. So they said, just paint out the background. So I painted out the background. And that was the final image. <laughs> and then it uh, turns out that the reason I had got the last minute call on this job was that the original painter from LA had, had walked out and wouldn't do the job because he didn't <laughs> like the director. And, uh, but then at the last minute, he came back and showed up with a painting. Oh. And they selected his painting. Oh. But I got paid. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so I didn't, you know. It's okay. This this painting went to the actor who is named Michael Gray Eyes. If you've ever seen him, and he does a lot of these uh, movies. Uh, but that was the uh, the story on that. And uh, this is a scene from the movie. By the way, they only showed one about two seconds of this scene. They didn't show any build-ups because he didn't do it. He just did one finished painting. This is the painting that they chose. And I thought, well, you know, that looks a lot more like the original of the, you know, the, of the original person. They didn't tell me that, that that's what they wanted. In fact, when I was doing the thing, they said, oh, his nose is a little bigger. You know, can you do this? Okay. And then, well, anyway, that's the story of movies. Uh, get it in writing, on the contract, <laughs> and the most important thing, put in the contract that if you change anything from the agreed upon image, that they have to pay extra. That's right. yeah. So after about the third change they made on me, I said, I'm not doing any more changes unless you pay me an addition, which they did. So I can't complain. <laughs> but uh, it didn't win the Academy Awards, so I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, I appreciate it. Um, there was, uh, I didn't know for sure how much I was going to be able to present. There was a few other things I was going to show you. But anyway, this will hopefully give you an idea of some ways you can use your computer or the proportion wheel to improve your layout and your, your drawing for your paintings. Because the, my approach to painting is that um, the foundation, like building a home, is the most important part of the painting. The first of the painting is more important than any other stage of the painting. If you don't get that right, nothing's going to turn out as well as it should. Like building a house, if you build it on a poor foundation, nothing's going to work. And so I stress building a good foundation, a good solid drawing, and then you can be freed up to really be creative in the painting stage where you want that spontaneity. Um, so any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it.